philosophy and public theology. That's been the, my, my interests. And I've been at Oak Hill for uh, 15 years, as I said. But um, in the last eight minutes, it's just been publicly announced that I'll be leaving Oak Hill next year to um, head up a new centre for culture, religion and mission, which will be part of an organisation called Crosslands, which I've been involved with since its uh, beginning. And it's uh, a kind of a, a joint partnership has been originally between Oak Hill and Acts 29. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm very excited. But as I said, it's only been announced in, in, in the last eight minutes, um, but it will be a new centre trying to do uh, research and training in areas of culture, religion and mission to equip um, local churches and to do some um, academic research, but also to disseminate that research uh, in terms of uh, training uh, disciples. Um, and uh, I suppose the leading question there, Neil, is that I, I, God willing, part of that work, I hope, will be involvement with the London Project. That's the, that, that, that's not a request, is it? That is a, that is a... <laughs> Yeah. That's a conversation we have had before now. Yes, that's not a surprise to you, Neil. Don't worry, no. don't worry, everyone. <laughs> yes. So uh, we we um, we know that if we're to try and reach a city of nine million, a super diverse global city like London, we need lots of uh, wisdom from above. But we also need those who have thought deeply about culture, public theology, how to meaningfully engage a city. And we're thrilled that Dan is. Uh, is going to work in partnership with the London Project um, into next year and just help to try and equip us, give us some of the tools that we need to most effectively uh, and collaboratively uh, try and serve and reach this great city. So uh, we're going to hand over to Dan now. And if you've not been in these conversations before, uh, the, the City Labs, um, just to say we will record it. Um, we, we won't be sending out or putting online any of the Q&A time that we have later on. So anything that you may ask or input into that time won't, won't be going out uh, more widely. But Dan's content uh, will. When we go as well into two short conversations in breakout group, groups, those won't be recorded either. So what you say won't be being shared more widely as you as you think and reflect on what we're learning together but uh, Dan's material will so that those who couldn't be here um, have the opportunity to, to benefit from that. Um, if you are also uh, can see the chat box at the bottom of the screen if you click on that you'll see that there is a handout if you want to be able to view that that um, has been made available to us and uh, you can just click on the download and view that, I hope. If you can't, my apologies to you. We will try and find another way to get to get that to you um, so you have a chance to look at that later. So um, I'm going to pray for Dan and uh, invite him to, to speak to us now. Father in heaven, we, uh, we, we know the gospel is the answer to every question and every hope and desire of everyone who lives in that city of London, but that we need help to winsomely and effectively and persuasively speak of Christ in a way that people understand and can uh, engage with and take to heart. So would you help us now as we listen to the, to the wisdom that, uh, that you have given to Dan, his thoughts on this topic of being magnetic and the, 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 the resource that will soon be available in the form of the book too. We thank you for his work and uh, ask that what we learn might equip us well um, in the task that you have called us to in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Neil. Great to be with you all. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a, a, an overview or a sketch of um, uh, issues that we could go into much more detail on and, and, and God willing, we, we will do. Um, and I want to try and make it as London centric as possible. As Neil just prayed, uh, this is a, a book that I'm working on uh, at the moment, both at a popular level and a more academic level. I've given, so this is a very condensed kind of 20 minute start and uh, um, uh, there'll be, it, it, it's starting a conversation in this area. Now I haven't been able to screen share, but that, that's okay. I wanted to start by just uh, describing to you two images. And the first was uh, during lockdown at the end of uh, about 400 meters down from Oak Hill College. There's a, uh, a very quite a famous uh, inclusive theatre called the Chicken Shed Theatre. And on day one of lockdown, um, when uh, they weren't able to put, uh, do any shows, there was a big poster hoarding which said this, Ubuntu, translated simply as humanity, or the belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. Chicken Shed will continue to strive 
to connect all people and all communities. I am because we are. Now, many of you on the call will know what uh, Ubuntu uh, means, uh, but I found it very interesting as I was walking along to see that was the big, uh, I suppose, preach, you could say, that was facing me uh, as I wandered along. And I wandered along about another 400 meters, and then I came to another sign outside uh, Cockfosters uh, tube station. Um, Whether you're born here or not, if you know to stand on the right, you are a Londoner. We are not an island. We're home to so much more. Now, these, as I said, I see this as being kind of preaches to us. And um, I just want to say a few introductory things and a particular uh, model of cultural engagement that um, I've been sitting on the shoulders of others, but to develop, I think, in a, in a more secular context. This comes in the broader context, I suppose, that many philosophers and sociologists of religion talk about. And as we're trying to understand the world uh, around us, um, we're, as we're to be those men and women of Issachar who know the times and know what Israel should do, uh, it's difficult sometimes to know to who, who to have faith in, in the analyses we've been given. Um, take, for example, the, the, the comparison between uh, Charles Taylor and Rodney Stark. Charles Taylor, Catholic philosopher, wrote this huge 800 page book called A Secular Faith. And he talks about how in the West, he believes that we've become disenchanted as a culture and uh, immune to deep religious experiences. And that there's been the triumph of what he calls scientism. That is that um, the genuine knowledge of reality must be determined by the hard sciences, i.e. physics, biochemistry, biology. Uh, to put it more popularly, it's the John Lennon um, song, Imagine, Above Us Is Only Sky, explanation of the world. And I'm sure you know people like that. Now, Taylor's analysis is very nuanced, and there's lots of it that I think is very helpful. He says that the secular is not simply about that people don't believe anymore. Being secular is about believability. It's that religion, whatever that is, is both contested and contestable. But there is a theme here of disenchantment. Now compare that with someone like Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark's an American historian at Baylor University. He has problems with this narrative that we have become disenchanted in the West. He says this uh, in his recent book, The Triumph of Faith, nor has Europe become disenchanted. Multitudes of Europeans believe in ghosts, lucky charms, occult healers, wizards, fortune tellers, Hulda folk, and a huge array of other aspects of that enchanted world that Taylor believes has long since vanished. What Taylor really demonstrates is that from nowhere is one's vision of modern times so distorted as from the confines of the faculty lounge. There you go, this is what these academics get up to in their kind of uh, fighting here. Now, um, what's interesting here is that uh, uh, um, Stark is one who, who has a lot of kind of qualitative and quantitative research to kind of back this up. Uh, one thing that I think you should be interested in, especially because London is one of the case studies, is a big interdisciplinary project that's currently going on. It finishes this year called Understanding Unbelief Across Disciplines and Across Cultures. And it looks at um, Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, the UK and the USA, looking at uh, what does unbelief look like? And it's uh, uh, kind of founded by the University of Kent, but there's other universities involved as well. They gave interim findings last year where they, uh, two of them I think are interesting to us. Unbelief in God, doesn't necessarily entail unbelief in other supernatural phenomena. Atheists and less so agnostics exhibit lower levels of supernatural belief than do the wider populations. However, only minorities of atheists or agnostics in each of our countries appear to be thoroughgoing naturalists. That is, they believe that nature is all that there is. Another one, another common supposition, that of the purposeless unbeliever lacking anything to ascribe ultimate meaning to the universe, also does not bear scrutiny. While atheists and agnostics are disproportionately likely to affirm that the universe is ultimately meaningless, in five of our countries it remains a minority view among unbelievers in all six countries. Now what I want to suggest to you, and London really does, uh, I suppose, uh, um, distill this or typify this, 
is that I think in some ways, both Taylor's analysis and Stark's analysis are true. There is disenchantment, but there's also enchantment at the same time. Um, anecdotally, I, I always give the example of the former Tottenham Hotspur manager, Maurizio Pochettino, uh, who um, in his office when he was manager had a bowl of lemons because he believes that when people come into the his office with negative energy, the negative energy would go into the lemons. So he changed the lemons every day uh, because they were wizened by negative energy. Now, this is someone who's the manager of a multi, multi million, billion pound uh, in industry, um, but has that level of kind of um, superstition. He talks about, I believe in energy universal, and he's written a book on it actually. Now, before we just uh, finish this little bit of a survey of what's around us, um, what I find fascinating here is that the, the hard science, I suppose, the, the technology as well, and magic, you think, how do you have these two things so opposing? Well, Peter Kreef, the Christian philosopher, uh, said that the following statement I'm about to read by C.S. Lewis is the single most illuminating three sentences I've ever read about our civilization. And this is what kind of unites these things together. Lewis says this in The Abolition of Man, there is something which unites magic and applied science, i.e. technology, while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline and virtue. Now, for magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. And the solution is technique. Now, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether that's a lucky charm, it's the idea of these, it's where I suppose magic and science unite. And historically, magic and science have been much closer together than one imagines. So we have a very um, uh, complex, I think, um, religious uh, enchanted or disenchanted scene. In fact, I want to call it a diff enchanted, as in I think we are enchanted as we've ever been, but maybe we're differently enchanted. Now, how do we compare that picture with what I would call um, a biblical theological anthropology? And again, we don't have time to go into this in huge amount of detail. I'm just gonna give a few minutes of laying the groundwork before I come to this particular uh, tool that I think is helpful. Um, God has revealed himself. We are revelations of God. We are made in the image of God. I'm sure you are, uh, uh, know that. Interestingly, in the Romans 1 passage that talks about this, what is revealed to all creation, in all creation, it's God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. And I'm trying to do some work on why, why are those the things that Paul says have been revealed? And my um, theory, and again, basing it on some work of others, is that eternal power is the idea that we are created knowing at some level that we are dependent upon God. The idea of dependence is very important. Divine nature, well, talks about nature, which gives the, the idea that God is not an it, but a person. That, that is, we are in relationship with someone. And if we are in relationship with someone who created us, there is the idea of responsibility or better accountability. So dependence and accountability. Creation of which we are created, ooze I suppose, or emanate the idea that we are dependent upon God and accountable to him. Now, I want you to lodge that in your mind because this is gonna become very important later on. Dependence and accountability. So we're made to relate we're made to cultivate. What does Romans 1, 18 to 32 say? Well, we suppress the truth. Literally, we, we hold the truth under water to drown it. We, we repress the truth. We substitute that truth for idols. Idols are, are to be found at the levels of ultimates, as it were, ultimate commitments, ultimate fears, desires, the everyday liturgies that form us or deform us. We can't fully suppress the truth because then we would have an excuse and we don't have an excuse. Now, this model of messiness, I suppose, of, of the unbeliever knowing and not knowing is one that's very um, uh, uh, sophisticated. I, I think we, we see what it looks like most in Acts 17, 
Remember, Paul's attitude is that he comes to Act 17, the only city, John Stott says, uh, the only city described as being submerged in idolatry, literally submerged in idolatry. And Paul has a, he's provoked by um, what he sees. And when Paul comes, to, uh, he's dragged in front of the Areopagus and he says, people of Athens, I see that you are very religious. Now, commentators have spent a long time trying to understand what that word means. The problem is that it's a hapax. It only appears once. But I think it, it both describes both people's running away from God and running to God, knowing God and not knowing God. Here's what one writer says. It's not beyond possibility that Paul cleverly chose this term precisely for the sake of its ambiguity. His readers would wonder whether the good or the bad sense was being stressed by Paul and Paul would be striking a double blow. People cannot eradicate a religious impulse within themselves, as the Athenians also demonstrate. And yet this good impulse has been degraded by rebellion against the living God, as the Athenians also demonstrate. Although people do not acknowledge it, they are aware of their relation and accountability, relation, accountability to the living and true God who created them. But rather than come to terms with him and his wrath against their sin, they pervert the truth. And in this way, they become ignorant and foolish. And because of that, of course, Paul's cry at the end is a call to repentance. Now, how do we how do we encapsulate that? Well, here is the tool that I'm trying to develop, and it's not my tool. It's a tool by the missiologist J.H. Bavinck, who lived between 1895 and 1964. He was a missionary in Indonesia. He then taught in Amsterdam at the Free University. He wrote what was for many years the um, missiology textbook called An Introduction to the Science of Missions. What's interesting in, in terms of the link to city to city is that Bavinck heavily influenced Harvey Kahn, Harvey Kahn heavily influenced Tim Keller. So there's a line from Babink through to Keller and especially um, Kahn's book, um, Urban Ministry, uh, which he wrote with uh, Manny Ortiz, where, he, where they talk about this tool, not in a, in a massive amount of detail. Babink looks at the world religions and he says, look, I, I, I phenomenologically see what's going on here. And there are these certain... Um, what he calls magnetic points or, or, or uh, itches that need to be scratched that the other religions all demonstrate. And my what I'm trying to do at the moment is not just apply those magnetic points to world religions, remembering that religion is a Western construct, that you know, Hinduism is a Western construct. But I think that these are universal truths that can apply to your most secular, hardened, I'm not interested in religion person, because they are part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Um, and so just very quickly before we go into breakout groups, now, if we had time I, I, in the book, I'm giving lots of practical examples of, of this, but these are the five points, I suppose. Remember, the, these are the ways in which we suppress and substitute the truth. Um, they're, they're, they're points of contact, but they're not, we don't affirm them because they, they're, they're, they're kind of the ways in which we, um, twist and distort the idea that we are dependent upon God and accountable to him, but these are the ways we suppress and substitute. So totality, um, is there a way to connect? These are my terms. All humans have an innate sense of totality, that they're small cogs in a much bigger mas machine. It's the idea that in some ways we're cosmically interrelated. We know as human beings that we're simultaneously small and insignificant, but also that when we connect with significant, we enjoy communal awareness, we crave connection, we feel abandoned after we've experienced it and crave for it again and again. Now, I'm just going to blast through here just some examples. And again, you can discuss these in your groups. But in, of course, in, in other world religious traditions, you've got the idea of enlightenment, Satori, or you've got in Buddhism, um, the individual or in Indian traditions, the idea that one has to lo lose one's individuality and ego in Brahman. Um, but what about secular, I suppose, secular examples? It's the trend of the popularity of, of who do you think you are? It's the family tree. We, we want to know we're part of something bigger. What about conspiracy theory enthusiasts? We want to see how we fit into the matrix. What about Comic-Con or pride parades? where those from the outside feel as if they're part of something bigger and they have significance. 
more generally stadium sporting events or music concerts where we know there's something more going on, almost transcendental that is different than if we were singing into our hairbrush in our bedroom. What about uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the avalanche, especially on London Tubes as well for dating agencies, eHarmony, Match.com, Silver Singles, Her. In, in the above us only sky world, romantic relationships often bear the weight that communion with God used to bear. Therefore, people have a stronger desire to consider themselves to have the need for that perfect relationship, the one. If any of you have seen the film Jerry Maguire, the idea of you complete me idea. So that's the first point. It's, the, it's called totality. We, we strive for a way to connect. Then we have this idea of norm. Is there a way to live? That there's a vague sense that there are rules to be obeyed. People know and accept that their moral standards and codes, which they must adhere. Now, of course, we see this all over the place at the moment. A friend of mine was in their local coffee shop the other day. A lady walked in pushing a buggy. As she walked up to the counter, she asked, are your straws paper or plastic? Fortunately, the owner said paper, at which the lady said, I'm so glad I can drink here. To be low plastic vegan socially aware is, is the new norm, which we feel we need to live up to. Not only do we need to live up to it, though, we need to be seen to be living up to it. Again, lots of examples we could use here. What about clothing? A friend of mine was a goth in their youth. Part of the appeal of being a goth is being different to the norm, but everyone has to be different together in the same way. And the goth rules are very different to the rules of the wider culture, but there are norms. Really well-established goths can wear baby pink because it's ironic, but if you wore it and you don't have the right credentials, you show yourselves as not fitting in. So the ideas of norms are really important here. Thirdly, deliverance. Is there a way out? We know there's something not quite right with the world. There's finitude and brokenness and, and wrongdoing. We mourn for a paradise lost. What um, people in, in literature have called sensukt, the idea of looking back romantically to a golden age. And we long for deliverance. Now, of course, we see examples of this all over the place, depending on what you think the problem is. If, if the problem is ignorance, then the deliverance is education. If the problem is public health, the, 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 the deliverance is a, is a remedy. Of course, overhanging all of this is the, is the problem of death. Um, how, do, how are we going to be delivered from that? And the culture has lots of ways of dealing with that. It's interesting, a pastor friend of mine said he's currently discipling two men who are addicted to the game Clash of Clans on their mobile phones. These are 30 year old Christian men simply because it's a way to escape their lives, but they escape still in ideas of having deliverance in, in the games themselves. Fourthly, destiny. Is there a way that we control? This is my favorite one. Um, one student wrote to me and said, when they were working in, in an office, you must never say the phones are quiet. You must never say the word quiet. If you said the word quiet, you'd be told off because that would mean, mean that some malevolent force would make the, the session busy. Now, I thought this was a complete joke, but this is everywhere. My son in the Metropolitan Police said it's exactly the case. Uh, over the radio, you do not say it's quiet tonight. You say the letter Q, because if you said quiet, it will make things start to happen. And um, there's lots of uh, peer reviewed research that I found in journals that try and do some kind of case studies on did saying quiet in accident emergency make any difference to how busy the, um, the, the session was. And then finally here, a higher power. This is kind of the super magnetic point where all the others converge. Is there a reality behind the greater reality? It's not simply belief in God. It's the idea, I suppose, of transcendence. Um, one example that I often use is this phenomena in the UK uh, called champing. Some of you may have heard of it. It's church and camping. So churches that are derelict or haven't got anyone going to them, um, you can rent out the church and sleep in the church overnight. And part of it is to be connected with the history. Um, 
one interview that I saw on ITV, uh, this lady was saying, well, she wanted her children to wake up um, to uh, stained glass, uh, the light coming through the stained glass, and it would give the kids a kind of a, a transcendental experience, as it were. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things going on there. Okay. All of these five magnetic points are press and substitute what Romans 1 reveals about God, dependence and accountability, so that the four, the, the magnetic points of totality and destiny are all about what, what is our relationship to the ultimate? Do we have freedom? Are we responsible? What's our significance? And then accountability is about norm and deliverance. It's about, we know there's a problem. We know there's norms. How do we break from those norms? How are we delivered from those norms? What happens when we transgress? Can we do that ourselves? And Baving has a really interesting way of in, interconnecting them as well. Now, what we're gonna do now in, in small groups for a few minutes is I'd love you to just, I know we've gone very, very quickly, but just to think, yeah, those five magnetic points, what might be some, I suppose, London examples of where we see totality or norm or destiny or deliverance or the higher power? Um, just talk in your groups uh, about just examples. I gave you my example. I mean, Ubuntu, that poster of the chicken shed. I mean, that's that's totality completely. This idea that I am because we are we need to connect in some way. I'd love to know how you see that in religion uh, in London, especially with regards to London being both enchanted and disenchanted. So we'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll come back uh, and do a little bit more about how we um, apply the gospel to these magnetic points. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. I think uh, Louise will put us into some breakout groups now. Neil, so we've got these uh, these five magnetic points, and I'm arguing that these are anthropological givens um, in terms of what it means to be made in God's image. And so they're very missio they're missiologically very helpful to us. And I want to suggest now, how do we connect the gospel of Christ? How do we connect Jesus to these points? I mean, obviously, Jesus is going to be the answer. Um, and the discipline under which I put this is maybe a, a, a discipline or a theological discipline you might not have come across before. It's called a elenctics, which comes from the Greek elengos, meaning um, to, to uncover, to bring to shame. This is the, the work that the Holy Spirit does in, uh, in John chapter 16. It, and it's the idea of uncovering idolatry for what it is and calling people to the living God. It's become, I suppose, it's fallen into disrepair as a term, but Bavink and Con are both people who uh, think that this is, a, this is a real science, and I'm trying to resurrect the, the science, it, um, as, as it were. Um, John Stott talks about it in um, uh, the Christian mission in the modern world. Interestingly, in his chapter on dialogue, he says you can only have dialogue when we recognise that Jesus Christ is final and unique and the evil of idolatry needs to be dealt with. You can only you can only do uh, you can only do dialogue when you have that recognition of unmasking idolatry. And so the way that we do that, and I know this is a bit of a, ch a cheesy naff way of doing it, but I think from um, various passages um, in, in Proverbs and others, what, what we do in, our, in a missionary encounter, in an elenctic encounter, is we do two things at the same time. We need to show on the one hand the appealingness of Jesus. He is the fount of living water. And on the other hand, we need to show the appallingness of idolatry. They are cracked pots or cisterns that cannot hold water jeremiah 2 so what we do in the in the missionary apologetic encounter is that we simultaneously show the appealingness of jesus and the appallingness of idolatry and we do that by showing how jesus is the subversive fulfillment of the magnetic points now subversive fulfillment is a term that i'm trying to kind of build a career on it's not my term it's by hendrik kramer the famous 20th century missiologist who only used it once but at a time when people were starting to think about were other religions stepping stones to christ kramer says no no jesus is completely other if you want to talk about um fulfillment though talk about jesus in terms of being the subversive fulfillment of culture and again if you read my book plugged in 
there's some seminal passages where I think subversive fulfillment is described. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 being uh, the, the classic in one in point. We preach Christ crucified in a way that subverts Jewish and Greek understandings of power and wisdom, but we do it in such a way where we can still say Jesus is power and Jesus is wisdom. So there's both subversion and there's fulfillment at the same time. Now, in a plugged in, I have a little kind of a model how we do that. Uh, I put in the handout here, enter, explore, expose, evangelize. Um, and that's great as a kind of a, 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 a framework. But what I'm kind of moving on to now is how do we actually uh, subvert and fulfill the magnetic points? So people in their religiosity are always expressing the magnetic points in various ways. The magnetic points are perspectives on the one idolater, the one person, um, the one religious consciousness. And I think the big thing that we have to be better on, we know that Jesus is the answer. We know that Christ crucified is the answer. But how do we narrate the gospel story? How do we introduce people to Jesus, the person of Jesus, in such a way that both subverts and fulfills in a way that answers the magnetic points, but in a subversive, fulfilling way? And what I'm trying to do in, in this section, and Bavink doesn't really go into much detail here. I'm trying to fill out Bavink um, and Con and, and others here, is that Jesus becomes the answer to the magnetic points. Jesus is the way that we connect. Jesus is uh, the way that we um, that we are to live. Jesus is the way out. He is the deliverer. Jesus is, is the one in control. And Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So um, let me just give one example here about how we how we might do this. And again, this isn't a set text. This is these are just ideas for engagement, really. So let's take the idea of totality, the way that we connect. Well. We have to show both the appallingness of idolatry or its futility and the wonderful living water of Jesus. Sporting and music events are fun, but they don't last. You sing your heart out at Wembley Stadium as if you're one huge connected organism, but then you ignore people on the way home. Um, where has community gone? Where are we meeting each other? Loneliness is a massive problem, especially in the city. People are dying alone. We have people overworked, so we have no time for community. What about the one, the perfect romantic relationship that never quite materializes? Now, how do we respond to that as Christians? Well, we say, don't we? Remember, totality is this idea that we can't work out. Are we both significant or insignificant? Well, the Christian worldview, the Christian narrative says, well, we're made in the image of God. And immediately that answers the question. We are totally insignificant in that we are not God. We are only images of God. To pretend that we are divine is wrong. But at the same time, we are hugely significant because we're images of God. We're created by God, in God's image. We're created from the earth. Adam, that's what Adam means. No wonder we want to be connected to the earth. No, 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 wonder, no wonder we feel solidarity with the, the world and the stewarding the world's resources because we are made from the earth. We're created for relationships and we're created with a purpose. But something has gone wrong. We crave for connection, but we're not connected. We're disconnected. We're disconnected from ourselves. We don't know who we are. We don't know what makes me me. We've lost our identity. We're at war inside our heads and within our bodies. We're disconnected from the environment. We don't know how to care for the, the resources around us. We're disconnected from each other. We're alienated. We're alone. And why would we want to be connected to this world, which the Bible says is a world that is perishing? But let me offer you Jesus. Jesus is the true image of God. He's the second Adam who both proclaimed and ushered another reality, a magnetic kingdom. This kingdom is brought about by his ultimate disconnection and reconnection, his death and resurrection. This is a kingdom where we die into, but we don't lose our individuality. We are born. We, we flourish because we then become who we were meant to be. Taking one stand in this kingdom does mean dying, but it mean, means finding ourselves anew in the resurrection. It means I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
and not only communion with God, but community with other Christians who are similarly united. The church is the place where we see that community. And Jesus is always connected to us. We can never say as Christians we are alone, that no one understands. Jesus knows he understands because he's one of us. Now, that's just an example. Of course, I could say you need to repent and believe or you're going to hell. But in this way, what we're trying to do is how does the narrative match with the magnetic point that the person is scratching at all the time? And you can do that for all of the magnetic points. On the norm, Jesus doesn't talk about an abstract law. He says, I'm the fulfillment of, of the law. And Jesus, Jesus's law is not um, a crusty conservatism rules for, for rules sake. It gets to the heart of what the problem is. That's why Jesus should be attractive both to conservatives and radicals at the same time. Or Jesus uh, is the way out. He the one who is the one who delivers us uh, uh, from from a fate worse than death, as it were. But also he delivers us to serve. Jesus is the way that we control. Jesus says of the superpower of the day you would have no power over me had it not been given to you from above we believe i believe as a christian that what well, is it you know whenever i go in a taxi in north london invariably it's a muslim driver with a magic eye looking over or it's this idea that um there's a malevolent force that makes spirits ring i can say as a christian not that i don't believe those forces exist but i believe that there is one who is above all of those and my relationship is not with an impersonal force or a capricious spirit. It's with a loving heavenly father. Jesus is the good shepherd. So, again, what we're trying to do here is to take those magnetic points and to say, how does Jesus both subvert and fulfill them? And of course, Jesus Christ is the higher power. He is the way, the truth and the life. He is a God who isn't out of reach, but a God who reaches down, a servant king, the word made flesh. So I think this is a very pregnant and potent tool that we need to, we can be developing. It's based on a very solid theological basis. Remember, Romans 1, um, eternal power, divine nature, dependence and accountability. We twist those things, but we can never get, we can never escape them. We can never escape our own humanity. And so we come with Jesus. We introduce Jesus who subverts and fulfills all those magnetic points. Now, it's very important as we finish here to understand our own role in this as Christians. Uh, Spurgeon preaches a great uh, sermon called The Marvelous Magnet, where he says Jesus is the magnet and we're magnetized by him. And uh, I, again, I have a whole section in this on the book, but. I believe that the church, the local church, the gathering of the church is about every week people come to be remagnetized by the means of grace, to be magnetized, to be sent out, to be magnets for Jesus. And that's why being together is so important. That's why I don't like virtual church because it's virtual. We're meant to be together, to be magnetized and sent out. Before we go into our groups, here's how uh, Bavink finishes uh, his point on the magnetic points. And the importance, and again, this is for our own humility, that we recognize that, that the magnetic points that draw other people away in idolatry, we still struggle with with indwelling sin. And it's only when we recognize that will we be able to um, have solidarity with others who are captured by sin. Bavink says this, it's only when I begin to understand a people, only after I've recognized them, in my own eradicable inclination to play a game with God that I can begin. I must feel a community or a fellowship with this person. I must know myself to be one of them. As long as I laugh at their foolish superstition, I look down on them. I have not yet found the key to their soul. As soon as I understand that what they do in a noticeably naive and childish manner, I also do and continue to do again and again, although in a different form as though I actually stand next to them, I can in the name of Christ stand in opposition to them and convince them of sin as Christ did with me and still does each day. So um, in our breakout groups, it would be great to discuss that. How, again, how uh, in the examples that you might have given in the first breakout session, 
How would you, at a very granular level, bring Jesus Christ to bear? How would you show that he is the subversive fulfillment of these magnetic points in the way that we teach, we preach, we have conversations with people? Um, and again, it's, it's about getting down to that level of detail because your average, I think your average Brit, whether um, uh, many secular Brits, they're not interested in hearing about God, Jesus and the Bible. They really don't want to know. But they are religious people who are expressing their religiosity. They're in a relationship with God already. And they're manifesting those magnetic points, even though they don't consciously think about it. That's what they're doing. That's what the Bible tells us. How do we bring the gospel to bear on those points? So let's have a few minutes in groups and then we'll have a Q&A. Thanks, Neil.